All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this next installment of our Pro Tech Talk series. We've got a really exciting topic today that I know we've been uh, hearing a lot about and talking a lot about and something that I'm really looking forward to the discussion we have today from our, our panel. So uh, what we'll do is during the registration process, everyone was given the chance to submit questions. And we got a lot of really good uh, questions for the panel that we've worked into the discussion today. So hopefully we'll cover as much as we can. And then um, at the end of this, uh, we are recording it. We will uh, post it online and send out a link to everybody that registered in case you wanna go back and revisit anything or see any of the previous talks. I'll put a, a link in the, the chat as well for all the previous ProTech talks if you'd like to go see those. So uh, for this time, buddy, I will drop off. I'm here if you need anything um, in the background, but I'll turn it over to you. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you to our panel. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, I'd like to welcome our panelists as well. Uh, goodness knows this is a very busy time for everyone. And I know that uh, you guys are very busy industry-wise and career-wise, so thanks for taking the time. And uh, one of the things we endeavor to do with these ProTech Talks is just share your experiences. You know, we don't expect you to necessarily take a particular position, just share your ideas, your experiences with uh, this particular topic, and uh, don't feel like you have to respond to every question that's asked. But, uh, you know, we're here to, to learn from you learn from your experiences as are the attendees that are present so thanks for joining us uh, before we kick off with uh, some questions to uh, address to the panelists i'd like to introduce the panelists uh, to begin with i'd like to start with uh, mike meyerhofer mike is the director of technology at liberty oil field services in denver uh, he leads a team of engineers providing advanced hydraulic fracture engineering solutions with a special emphasis on unconventional shale and tight oil and gas plays. Previously, he was the director of the Fracturing Center for Excellence at Pinnacle, which is a Halliburton service in Houston. And prior to that, he worked for Union Pacific Resources in Fort Worth. He has a doctorate in petroleum engineering from a university that was previously known as Steyr Markish Stanlisha Montal Leronstalt. I'm just practicing my German a little bit. I'm sure I blew it, but but uh, it was later moved uh, about 30 miles away to Leoben, Austria, and became known as the Mining University of Leoben. So welcome, Mike. Mike also tells me that his favorite college hangout was an institution known as Stebeisel. So it's, uh, if you know your German, it has something to do with a pub. So thanks, Mike, for joining us. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> good German there. No, you don't have to say that. I know it wasn't very good. <laughs> okay, next up is Jerry Torres. Jerry serves as Vice President for Permian Completions for Pioneer Natural Resources, a position he has held since September, 2015. Uh, Jerry's team is responsible for designing and completing the company's new horizontal wells with an emphasis on ensuring safe, environmentally sound wells that perform at maximum capital efficiency. Uh, Jerry joined the company in 2005 as an operations engineer. In 2007, he was promoted to completions manager. You were a fast mover there, Jerry, in two years, jumping all the way to completions manager and served in that role for the next seven years or for the next seven years, he held positions of increasing responsibility within the completions team before being named to his current leadership role. Pioneer currently drills in the Permian Basin of West Texas, and Jerry also led completions in previous regions, including the Gulf of Mexico, South Texas, the West Panhandle, and Alaska. Prior to joining Pioneer, Torres worked for BJ Services. I'm with you, I was there, good job. Uh, Torres graduated from Texas A&M in College Station, so I think it's pretty obvious for the Aggies in the audience, his college hangout was the Dixie Chicken, of course. That's a Absolutely. good one. All right. Next up is Ollie Donashe. Uh, Ollie is a consultant in the oil and gas industry, best known for his expertise in well completion, hydraulic fracturing, and geomechanics. 
He received an engineering degree from the School of Engineering at the University of Tehran, an MS from the University of Minnesota, and a PhD from the University of uh, Missouri Rolla. His work experience includes Director of Petroleum Engineering and Adjunct Professor at the University of Houston, Vice President of Integrated Technology Products, and multiple other technology management positions in the US and international for Halliburton. He was the co-editor in chief of the Hydraulic Fracturing Journal, which is one of my favorite journals. I'm just disappointed it couldn't continue, but bless his heart, Holly was pretty well funding that journal himself. So that was a great service to the industry that he did for us. It was a quarterly publication entirely dedicated to various technical and operational aspects of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, Ali has over 75 publications in various areas of the oil and gas completion and production areas mostly covering hydraulic fracturing and associated technologies, and is the author of a recent book, this is very timely, entitled Frack Driven Interactions, FDI, colon, Guides for Real-Time Analysis and Execution of Fracturing Treatments, and is currently teaching a course on this subject. Isn't that right, Ollie? Aren't you teaching a course on that subject? Yes, I'll, yes, I'll be teaching that course on July 13th in Houston. It's a one-day course. Okay, great. And he is an SP honorary member of he's an honorary member of the SP, which is a very high honor. Not very many people reach that level. Uh, not sure about his college hangout. He he wouldn't come. He wouldn't level with me on that. So I'm not going to guess. And lastly, we have Tanner Wood. Tanner is a region engineering advisor at Protechnics in Houston. He has served in this role for seven years across multiple regions. He has been primarily focused on completion diagnostics and design optimization and has authored and co-authored numerous SP papers covering topics on refractoring, diversion, and fracture-driven interactions. Prior to Protechnics, Tanner served as a district engineer at GoFrac and is a graduate of Trinity University in San Antonio. And he tells me his favorite college hangout was an institution called Bombay's Bicycle Club. Somehow, I doubt seriously that bicycles had anything to do with that institution, but there you go. Very little. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. And without further ado, uh, let's jump into some questions. Uh, our topic is modern simulfracs. So we're going to spend most of our time talking about simulfracs, but also we'll, uh, we'll get sidetracked a little bit, hopefully intentionally, to talk about maybe how they compare with zipper fracks and conventional fracks, uh, what the future holds for this technology, and also talk a little bit about uh, FDIs, fracture driven interactions. So uh, hopefully there'll be something for everyone that will uh, help move them up the learning curve. I know I'll be moving it up. All right, question number one for the panel. Uh, someone describe a simulfrac and explain the differences between it and a conventional frac and a zipper frac. So who wants to start with the definitions here? What is a simulfrac and how does it compare or contrast with conventional fracs and zipper fracs? If you're going to, that's going to be hesitant, I'll, I'll call on you. Mike, you're kind of Go moving ahead. in that direction. Okay, sure. Uh, my understanding of a, of a simulfrac and, and the way it was originally first done in the Barnett Shale, uh, it, it was in kind of the original simulfrac was just fracking two wells parallel to each other offset wells at the same time, two frac spreads, uh, fracking them at the same time. Uh, fractures approaching each other. The idea was, you know, putting more energy into the rock with, with these two wells, fractures approaching each other, avoiding each other, creating more density, potentially more SRV, basically more branching and creating more surface area, right? Which was a key thing back then in the Barnett Shale, right? Uh, was and, and these days as well, obviously non-conventional, right? Creating some so that was the original kind of understanding of the of the of the 
of the original simul frac, right? And and then the cousin afterwards, because the logistics of doing that were pretty tough, right? So it wasn't it wasn't easy to do that. And so the the cousin kind of the zipper frac came about then where you don't do it necessarily simultaneously, but you just do it sequentially each well, you swap from one well to the other, you know, that's the standard zipper frac. I think that everybody's familiar with, right? Um, actually, the original term zipper also came a little from the fact that people were actually trying to offset the perfs a little from each other. So knowing the frac azimuth, you know, from microseismic mapping, right, offsetting the perforations a little so that the fractures would kind of not grow right into each other, but kind of adjacent to each other. And that kind of had that impression of a zipper, right? Like closing or opening a zipper, right? So I think that's how that term zipper frack came about. And obviously conventional frack is, you know, fracking a single well, right? The way we're doing uh, in a lot of places uh, or, or we have done before we move to the, you know, pad operations and zipper frack. So, so that's kind of my quick, <laughs> overview of what I, I understand with those terms. Now, maybe one thing on the simul frac, but maybe we'll get into that later as well is, you know, there's other terms people use interchangeably. So there may be a little bit confusion. Some people may refer to dual fracking and but we probably will get into more details on uh, in the discussion on that, what, what differences there are with that. So. Thanks, Mike. Um, anybody want to? Add to that, that was a pretty good summary. Well, let me just ask this then. Uh, for those of you who are more familiar with simul fracks, have, have participated in them, what do you see as the key drivers for utilizing simul fracks? So one of the key drivers for Pioneer, of course, is, you know, because you have two two fleets or essentially one and a half fleets on your location, we are looking for a cost benefit. And the other reason is because you're able to complete a pad in less number of days, you can also put those wells online faster, which means you can use it as a lever for production growth as well. Good point, good point. What about Ali? Can you envision some other benefits, advantages? I'd like to start this discussion by making an observation, and that is, anytime we, th we think something something cannot be done, somebody comes along and does it. Amen. And uh, this is one of those situations in which, as people faced uh, difficulties and complications in fracturing horizontal wells, multiple fractures in horizontal wells. Those among us who were more creative and uh, had more uh, uh, you know, challenging mind decided that they needed to do something about it. And this has been a progression along those lines. And, and I also want to make another observation. We are very fortunate to be in this kind of an industry, in an industry in which people innovate, people come up with new concepts and ideas, which makes life easier for all of us. To me, the point here is having done that, now how do we move forward from where we are? Getting, having what we have, what, what are the next steps to move forward and make the life even better and easier and production uh, less expensive, less complicated and so on. And I'm sure our panelists will have lots of ideas to share with us. But uh, the, the main point is to understand that within our industry, we have got lots of innovators and we are very lucky to be working with them. Very That's well said, well said. Tanner, what do you think? Can you think of some other drivers that we haven't brought up yet? You know, I think we've kind of touched on the main ones. A lot of this really did stimulate from what Jerry was saying. Completion time savings, cost savings are gonna be the main ones. And I know Mike kind of mentioned on this, at the beginning, when you're talking about the barnet that hopefully is stimulating two wells at the same time, maybe we might be getting some more complexity, maybe we might getting, be getting some better SRV. But, you know, jury's still out on that, but I'd say overall, you know, completion time and cost savings are the two big things that operators are touting these days. 
I would like to add another aspect to this, and that is uh, the social benefits of this process. When you consider the amount of, you know, the criticism that we get in, within the community uh, for taking, you know, spending two weeks time and uh, setting up places and, you know, all of that. The fact that we are doing these things much shorter period of time has got social benefits that I think needs to be emphasized by all of us. This is a socially responsible action that the industry is taking. And, you know, speaking of that, I have read one of the advantages that has been put forth for Simulfrax is an HSE advantage. You know, Jerry mentioned you can sort of frack two wells with one and a half fleets. And so that's a little less diesel burned by trucks on the way to locations. So, uh, you know, that's uh, maybe not the key driver, but uh, certainly in this day and time, that's one we should all probably should be heralding when we talk about these advantages. Okay. All right, what do you think? Do you think the industry has really bought into the economic operational advantages? Have you bought into it? Do you all believe this is a direction we should be going and does the industry seem to agree with that? What do you think? From my perspective, 100%. Okay. Um, you know, this is where we're headed. And if we think about future wise where we'd like for it to head is being able to do simulfrac and you know combining it with an ESG friendly fleet with an E fleet or DGB equipment where you can reduce emissions and also get your wells done faster and cheaper is a great thing. Now, if we can also then utilize as we see the industry going with, you know pumping units that now have double pumpers or double units on it, our footprint also gets smaller. So at the end of the day, I see it going into the win, win, win category. So I think these are here to stay. And, you know, as we move in and really started, you know, really tackling our ESG goals, this is definitely one of our levers on how to get that accomplished, buddy. You agree, Mike? Are you 100% behind it? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I agree. I think we're, we're, we're heading in that direction, but I think there's still some work to be done, all right? I know from the service company, I mean, there's still some challenges, no question, because we still have to move out with a lot of equipment. A lot of times, you know, how many blenders do you need, for example? Um, you know, as you go to, you know, above 120 barrels a minute on your rate, for example, right, that becomes a challenge then, you know, you're going to need two probably, and, but there's all things that can be probably solved on the equipment side, right, to make this more efficient. Obviously, the footprint discussed, I mean, it's still pretty large, because we've, we've done some of these operations, and we still have basically two frack fleets out there, um, to accommodate, you know, 120 barrels a minute, or maybe even more than that, right? And um, and then, of course, if you come down to like 100 barrels a minute, let's say, uh, combined rates of 50 barrels into each well, that of course throws up other questions. Then on the completion side, you know, do you have to reduce your stage length? Then do you do less clusters because now you're pumping at a lower, you know, 50 barrel a minute instead of maybe 80 or 90 that you originally maybe did on a single well. So that throws up questions about limited entry and, and, and some of these issues. And um, so th those are, uh, I, I think I, I agree with the fact eventually, I think it's going to take off a lot more probably, but there's still, I think some things to be, some details, right, to, to be worked out, right? Um, and it may depend on where you're at and what your target rates are and all of that, right? But, um, all right, we seem to have <clears throat> some unanimity here in supporting the future for Simulfrax. So, uh, Tanner, you wanna take a shot at how you might choose? You got your own wells, your own family of wells here. Uh, some of the criteria you would consider in choosing between a conventional, a simul, or a zipper frac, zipper frac, or a particular 
well or a particular play? How would you go about making that decision? Well, from a simul fracture standpoint, I would definitely want to find the easiest, most uniform rock to be fracturing. You know, I think I wouldn't be wanting to go into an overpressured or I wouldn't want to be going into a formation that has a higher tendency to screen out if I'm going to be cracking into two wells at one time. I would also look at the logistics of it. It is a bigger footprint. You know, do we have room for all this equipment at this particular area, geographic region, or whatever the case may be? But yeah, you know, really just wanting to have the most uniform rock possible. I'm going to be fracking into two wells simultaneously, and I really want to limit the variability between those two wells. Uh, Gotcha. Now, Jerry Pioneer is kind of a, a, a single play player these days, but, uh, and I know that's probably not entirely true, but uh, do you have reason to believe that simul frac effectiveness may be formation or reservoir specific or basin uh, specific? So early time, you know, we've, we haven't seen any uplift or degradation either way. So right now the benefits are as I mentioned, that you do get a cost benefit in addition to accelerating your putting wells online. So those are the benefits we see uh, on our side. And, you know, a little bit to add a little bit to what Tanner was talking about. Ideally, we would want a simul frac on a pad that's four wells or greater. I know some folks have done some three well simuls. And however, to get maximize the full benefit of, you know, having two wire lines on location, two frac fleets or a fleet and a half, essentially, it's best to have four or more wells. And whether they're Wolf Camp A's, B's, spray berries, it really doesn't matter. Um, so formation doesn't matter. And since our completion designs don't change much, we don't expect much change in in frac geometries as well. Great. Uh, Ali, International, what do you see as the future for uh, Simul Frax International? You do a lot of consulting for international operators. You're muted. You're muted, Ali. Oops. Thank you. you yes, I. <laughs> Uh, the process will grow internationally, and uh, as more and more people get into more and more complicated reservoirs, the process will gradually grow, and it will become more popular. I think so, too. Uh, what about, uh, you know, I think most people would say the cost savings is a, is a key driver in this day and time, because everybody's all operators about cost efficiencies. Uh, what do you see the effect of commodity prices? If commodity prices go up, is that gonna make it uh, more appropriate to do simul fracks? Uh, what about uh, pumping service costs? You know, obviously the pumping service companies are gonna be uh, inching their prices up a bit. Is that gonna affect simul fracks? Any, any of the cost constraints are gonna push it one way or the other that you can see? You know, that's a crystal ball question. I mean, Mike, you know, you kind of work both sides of the street there, sort of as an operator and a service company. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's along the lines of what I said before. There, there are still a few challenges on the, you know, again, on the, you know, the you can reduce the time, you reduce well swaps and things like that. But uh, obviously, if you have to have, you know, two or one and a half, even frac spreads out there, you still need the personnel, right? So it's still... I mean, there's no question of how do you have one data van, right, that manages all that. So do you need more personnel, right, to track all these things at the same time? So it's definitely a, there, there are some no questions, some some costs involved in that. But but yeah, is the overall, you know, reduction in completion time, right? Does that uh, kind of uh, exceed, you know, all of these other things that may come to play, right? Um, on the efficiency and the cost side on the on the service side right but but i think you know all these things as we do many more of these right i, I wouldn't say it's a standard thing we're doing right it's it's not like majority of definitely majority of our jobs right now are not you know simul operations if you will say, right? it's still 
it's still a small percentage, I would say, of, of overall the jobs we do. But as always, you know, we'll, we'll, we learn, right? And we adapt and we improve. And, and if, if this takes off from an operator side more, hey, we want to do it, you know, simul frack. Um, yeah, I think service companies will adapt and hopefully we can all find a good, uh, you know, cost structure together, right? That works for everybody. Got you. Uh, Derek's probably time for a poll question, I'm guessing. Let's see. Yeah, we can we can do one. We've got a couple to choose from here. Kind of let me see where we are based on our discussion. Now, these poll questions are for everybody in the audience. So we want everybody, including the panelists, to vote here and we'll report the results. So you can kind of see how how your stance compares with the uh, this somewhat limited. Uh, we, there you go. We, we talked about this one a little bit. We kind of covered it, but we can see what get some thoughts from the audience as well here. Okay. We'll launch it real quick. There we go. What are your personal completion preferences for the future? Again, your personal preferences, maybe your company's personal preferences, however you want to vote. Conventional zipper, simulfrax. And I guess what we mean by that is your preferences, not necessarily what you're doing, but what you think you, you would prefer or your company, maybe it's moving in that direction. So we can give it just a, a second to let everybody Yep. Vote, and then I can go ahead and show the results here too. There's a few more trickling in as people mull it over, I guess. All right, I can go ahead and All right. close this one down and I'll put the results up. Pull them up. In the meantime, uh, I think we've heard Jerry's corporate opinion, Simulfrax, they're going much more and more in that direction. Uh, Mike would like to see some of the, the challenges dealt with uh, before it becomes, uh, you know, the, the prime option. Well, it's definitely not conventional frax, that's for sure. So zipper frax and simul frax are running kind of a close race there. I'd say given this data size, that's probably not a significant difference. So, so boy, if you're into conventional frax, you better get with the program here, it looks like. All right, thanks. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, what are some operational or technical prerequisites for doing simulfrax? I mean, I think there's an obvious one, footprint, but what, what are some others, some, some prerequisites that you need to think about before you jump into simulfrax? What about it, Jerry? What do you guys? As an operator, the, the key thing is logistics, right? So you've got to have, you know, enough water to essentially feed two fleets if needed, right? So it, in, instead of providing large volumes of water to one fleet now, essentially you got to provide it to either one and a half or two times, right? And if you're operating at, you know, if you're fracking 21, 22 hours a day, that means that location's got to have quite a bit of water, right? Along the same lines, you know, same thing goes for profit. So, you know, you could have, you know, 20 plus, you know, sand, either sand silos or sand boxes or whatever your usage is, unload in sand at the same time. So logistics is, ex is extremely huge on this. You know, the other thing is I know you know, if we went to on a single fleet line, we went from zipper frax to simul back to zipper. It's very disruptive, you know, to both the vendors, you know, Pioneer, logistics, et cetera. So it's almost easier to set up your scheduling where you've got your, your, your zipper fleets and then you've got your simul fleets. And they move from simul to simul to simul. So you've got minimal disruptions. So those are some of the, the key things that, that you've got to watch out for, but mainly it's logistics and 
make sure you've got, you know, your your bank of wells for that simul fleet to follow thereafter. Gotcha. Got to have good water infrastructure and good sand contracts, good logistics contracts. And a frack company that knows what they're doing. Yep, frack com company has experience in these multiple fracks. And you know, just just as important as the frack companies, those wireline crews. Sometimes you're only as good as those wireline crews are. You know, same thing goes for frack valve and frack valve companies, etc. So you've got to have a a couple of great teams on the same location because any of them going down is is really you know detrimental to the two or the one and a half fleets that you got on location. Sure. One of the major requirements of this process is very good coordination between the different players. Yeah, Ali, speaking of, uh, I would think one of the prerequisites would be some design engineers that are familiar with doing multiple fracks you know, when they come to designing them. Uh, do, you, do you see that as being different than just conventional single well design? when you sit down to start designing them? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, okay. No, not really, no. The uh, design is more or less the same. It is the manipulation of the equipment and people in order to move from one to the other. That's, uh, as far as the design is concerned, uh, I think the design process would be basically the same. Okay. Yeah, the, the only thing I wanted to throw in on that is, is what I also mentioned earlier. Let's say you, you have to come down on the rate a little, the pump rate, right? Are you in a, in a, in a rock or in an area where, you can, where it's okay to pump at a little lower rate? Um, or do you have to change your stage length, your cluster strategy, the limited entries? That's my only concern that if you wanna get an equivalent stimulation that you would have gotten with a zipper frack where you pump 90 barrels a minute. Now you have to pump 60 barrels a minute. Can you do it with the same stage lengths and cluster design, right? Or not, right? Um, I think that may require a change. And then of course you have to look at the efficiency. If you have to add, let's say more stages because you shorten your stage lengths, then you could add more cost or more time from that perspective, right? But if you feel like you're in a, in, a, in an area in Iraq where where you know from you know previous wells you've done you know 60 barrels a minute with a stage line the cluster design is fine, um, and you already have maybe offset drainage so parent wells out there right, um, you want to avoid frack hits and things like that, you know again this could picture into the overall design discussion so which may be a little different than a standard zipper frack or, or the, the way the conventional fracks were raised. And I would add to that the basically the knowledge and expertise of the people on location who are uh, executing the process. Amen. Now, Tanner, you worked the, the Bakken, as I recall, before you came over. For, for a, a rough few months. Oh, okay. I thought it was longer than that. <laughs> I, would, I would think that uh, the uh, simulfrax might be a little more challenging in, in the Rockies simply because of the locations, you know, the size of the locations, getting to location. You see that as a problem, Tanner or Mike, either one, both of you. I mean, obviously it, work the Bakken. It certainly plays a factor in there. I mean, if you look at the statistics on where simulfrax are and aren't being employed, obviously there's going to be some regionalness to that, whether that's just the geographic surface or maybe it's the formations themselves. You don't see much Hainesville going on. You see a whole bunch of high percentage out in the Permian. You do see some in the Bakken. You do see some in the Eagle Fort and some other plays. But there's certainly a geographicness to where these uh, simulfracks are being heavily utilized. I mean, we are we are doing them in the in the DJ, for example. So, you know, pretty urban, relatively speaking, right, uh, where it's being done. And but it's not necessarily the, the big, you know, two fleet equivalent type of simul or dual fracks, right? It's, it's at a reduced rate per well, right? So the footprint overall is not like expanded significantly, right? But, but 
we do do it here in the Denver area. So, yeah. Okay. From, from some of the information I have, uh, the equipment is being uh, upgraded and the putting it together is uh, being made better to facilitate injections as high as 80, 90 barrels per minute into each well. And, uh, and that's, quite an, that's quite an accomplishment. And of course, the other point to consider also is that uh, if there are interactions between the fractures, especially if the two wells are parallel with each other, if there are interactions between these fractures, then one of the future channel, channels is going to be how to detect those interactions and how to respond to them. Yep, we'll get to that here in a little bit too, for sure. All right, Jerry, you're on the spot. Uh, it sounds like you probably done, Pioneer may have done more uh, simulfrax than most. Uh, do you see a clear cut EUR benefit from simulfrax? Can you make a case for it? Right now, you know, in, in all honesty, we did not go into this thinking we would get an EUR lift or a degradation really we're you know with completion designs fair being fairly similar what we expect is cost savings and you know time to get wells on production faster so what we've seen early time on production is no different than zipper frax okay i'd say that's something that i've seen across a lot of papers that are being written so far and a lot of other operators neutral on the EUR, not, nothing gained, nothing lost in the early time. So the real financial benefit is the cost savings more so than maybe even enhanced production. Right. So, you know, buddy, one, one, one of the things where, I mean, lots of operators have had this experience where we would have synced rigs and synced fleets fracking right next to each other. You know, had we seen production benefit, we would probably have seen that with the sink frack fleets where we've got two pads right by each other and drilling, you know, those wells that were offset and right each other and haven't seen uh, any improvement or any degradation, buddy. So with either zipper fracks, sink fracks, or simul fracks, we haven't seen any difference yet. That's good to hear. Positive or negative. You know, this may be a page out of oil field lore, but I heard an individual once say that he was on location for two Barnett simulfracs at 100 barrels per minute each. And he was convinced that he was standing there while those two simulfracs were going on. He could see the earth rising. So I don't know if that's true or not, but. Makes for a good story anyway. Was his name Buddy Woodruff? As a matter of fact, yeah, it was. I, I really did think I saw the earth rising. I really did. Maybe I just wanted to want it to happen. We, anyway. Talking about the Barnett, uh, Buddy, we, we did look way back in my pinnacle days. You know, we did micro seismic on these simul fracks, right, originally. And um, we definitely saw a lot more micro seisms. So, I mean which was kind of the encouragement that, you know, there's something going on, maybe more intense fracturing, maybe more denser fractures that were creating, right? And we did look at the production of, of those and it seemed like the, the, while the overall, you know, SRV that we quantified back then as the, the cube of microseisms, basically the space that the microseisms took up in the, within the Barnett, right? Um, was not really all that much bigger than, you know, if you'd had fracked these wells individually, but the well performance, you know, when we plotted the well performance versus the, the SRV from the micro seismic data, those two simul wells, you know, outperformed the individual wells, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so that was back then kind of, we thought, hey, you know, physically, maybe we did something in the rock that improved the density of fracturing, thus, you know, elevating the production. But, but again, you know, back then, 
the logistics were just a nightmare and it 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 you know the simul fracking kind of stopped at that point but but of course then the zipper fracking eventually took over and the thought was well the zipper fracking is almost doing the same thing you know down from a downhole perspective now uh, because the time between the stages is not all that large, maybe an hour or two, right? And you're still getting the benefit of the stress shadow, you know, from the previous stage in the other well. So you're creating a almost a similar scenario as you would do with a true simul frack, but you don't have the logistics. I mean, back then that logistics nightmare, right? Of two frack fleets and all that. So, so that that was some additional thoughts from historically from back then. What what I remember. All right, let's, let's look to the future. Ollie was uh, prompting me this week. He said, you know, let, let's go forward here. You know, what does the future hold? How should we approach the future on Simulfrax? And he's right. Uh, let's put the rest of the emphasis or most of the emphasis in, in the future. So let me ask this first question. Uh, do you see pad structures and well footprints being changed to accommodate Simulfrax? Have you seen any of that done? Is it being done? Or are you just, you know, you don't plan that far ahead for a simul frack? So who do you want to hear from, buddy? Anybody. Go ahead, right. Jerry. <laughs> so what we see now or what we plan yeah, going to see? forward? Are, are you going to be changing the pad designs to accommodate simul fracks or not? Are you going to go that far with it? I would say here in the very short term, not very much of a difference, but as we start looking into the future, the, you know, we start pairing it with E-fleets and things like that, you know, and, you know, pair up with E-fleets with these larger horsepower pumps that are more in the five to 8,000 horsepower units per, per pumping unit, we can definitely see the pad size potentially being smaller, but along with those things, we as operators also got to look at our infrastructure and also be thinking in the future of potentially supplying uh, electricity to these locations, you know, and or natural gas or field gas, you know, along with any CNG that's required. So, these are things that we would see in the future. So, you know, good well costs, you know, at, you know, putting wells online a little faster, but with a smaller carbon footprint on it at the end of the day would be a tremendous win. Gotcha. Um, all right, how about some of you design guys? I guess, especially Ali and Mike. Uh, <laughs> To me, one of the very important aspects of fracturing is to look at what is necessary, what is necessary for us to get the production and what is excessive. And in right now in the, for example, in zipper fractures that we do, when in quite a few of these, when I look at post uh, treatment data and so on, I see that we are going excessive. The logic behind that is quite straightforward and reasonable. And that is these horizontal wells are so complicated to fracture that if we are going to fracture one of them, we are better off overdoing than underdoing. Because if we underdo these fractures, uh, correction of the underdone jobs is going to be quite expensive and complicated. So at the present time, the natural tendency is to overdo these jobs. And in order to, for us to know exactly how much is necessary, what is the right size treatment, we need to have real-time diagnostics. And in order for us to have real-time diagnostics, we then need to consider, uh, for example, the sequence of fracturing, the uh, uh, location of the wells, are, are we going to fracture parallel wells or one, or, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, as an example. Let's say that uh, we have four wells we want to fracture. Um, maybe one of the things we need to consider is to do well one and three and monitor pressure in two and four, monitor the FDI pressure to see what's going on. And then 
by the time we get through with that, for example, if we are fracturing one and three, we can establish did we sufficiently fracture the area around number two well, that it may not even need fracturing in the future. Those are the efficiencies that we need to look at. Or otherwise, you know, fracture two and four, and then monitor the pressure in one and three to see exactly how far did these fractures go and how did we uh, accomplish what we wanted. And of course, then uh, combine these with the production data and the rest of it. To me, that's the direction for the future of these, how to monitor what's going on in real time and what architecture should we use in order to have that monitoring done uh, to the best benefit of our treatment and financial and operational and so on. So Tanner, uh, do you think simulfrax are going to, uh, to put a limitation on, uh, on real-time design changes that are gonna limit us? What about uh, engineered completions? So, I, I mean, I certainly agree with what Ali said. Diagnostics are critical to understanding what exactly is going on. The more wells you're fracking at once, though, I mean, obviously that's going to make the real-time analysis a little bit more difficult. If simul fracking two wells turns into three wells or four wells at once, kind of muddies the water a little bit as to what exactly is, which well is causing what response that we're seeing where. Uh, as far as engineered perforating goes, I mean, that's certainly a consideration. I mean, if I'm fracking multiple wells at the same time, I'm going to want to have all my perforations and like rock, if possible, to give myself the best chance to have everything on location go smoothly or go effectively. Spoken like a true geologist, a like rock guy. Um, all right, Jerry, you said uh, EUR didn't really fit into the equation just yet as far as evaluating these wells. Uh, so what, what criteria would you recommend operators focus on when they're going to do simul fracks? What kind of criteria should they use to evaluate the overall effectiveness of the strategy? So kind of like I stated, you know, things that you need, need to make sure you have is the logistics in place, right? You've got to make sure you've got enough water enough sand, et cetera. But what's also, if you've got a frack plan, you've got to be able to keep that crew consistent. So don't move a simul, a simul fleet to a zipper fleet back to a simul fleet. Make sure to have enough wells in the plan where you could feed enough water, enough sand to keep a, you know, a simul fleet busy. Have your simul fleet be a frack line of its own uh, and have your standard zipper fleets have their own frack line. You'll have minimal interactions. And as I mentioned, ideally you'd want four more wells. So pads that are, you know, two well pads, three well pads, probably be best to move those to your zipper, uh, zipper frack lines versus your simul frack lines et cetera, uh, those are some good general guidelines. And, you know, of course, you know, you talked about oil price, really oil price um, doesn't play as much into the decision whether a simul or a zipper makes, makes a big difference other than, you know, when you, you're in depressed environments, some of the things that you wanna make sure that, that you've got a good handle on is your capital burn rate, right? You're fracking wells faster, you're putting them online faster. So if you've got a certain capital that, that you need to keep on track, et cetera, just like your production levers, your capital levers, all of those things, it's, you, you put them all into the, into the scheduling models and see what makes the best sense for your company, your profile, your production targets, capital targets, cash flow, et cetera. Great. Uh, about another poll question. Eric? Sure, we've got one here that we can, again, we, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but talking about the challenges or disadvantages with Simulfrac, we can look at 
All right, what do you see as potentially the biggest disadvantage of Simulfrax? Okay, let's, let's try to be open-minded here. Certainly sounds like a good idea, but large footprint, no real time. At, at, the present, at the present time, the disadvantage that I see, and I think this is temporary, as I said, innovative people who face problems and solve them are going to get into action and take, take care of this. But the, the limitation that I see at this time with our present practices are that uh, our diagnostics are quite limited. And I think that needs to be the focus of uh, further attention and further innovation. How do we increase the diagnostic tools available to us so that we can take better advantage of this real nice innovation and to make it even more productive for us. Okay. All right, let's all let's all vote here. Got a couple more trickling in that I'll okay. shut it down. All right. Um, here you go, buddy. Here's the results before you get okay, go ahead. moving on. And the biggest potential disadvantage is logistics. Son of a gun. Well, I finally voted right on one of them. So horsepower, sand, trucking, I think we've kind of discussed that a bit, uh, more so than footprint. I think uh, I would have thought there'd been more folks voting for the footprint issue, especially maybe in the Rockies or the Appalachia, you know, where they have some tricky locations, but logistics. All right, thank you everyone for the vote. Okay, uh, before we get into FDIs, uh, which is going to involve some of the questions that we're going to be looking at here ongoing. Uh, is there something on the horizon? Okay. Is there something on the horizon that may even be better than Simulfrax? I think Jerry talked about electrical frack fleets. That's, you know, that's, that's definitely coming. Can you see anything on the horizon that might be a a, uh, a significant magnitude improvement in the way we do fracks. Anybody? <laughs> if we could simul drill, that simul would be a drill. <laughs> that would be a huge game changer. So, how do you simul drill exactly? Exactly. If somebody could figure out drilling, you know, on the same pad with, you know, a couple of rigs, it would really change the game as well. Simul drilling. Hmm. Yeah, and at, at what point there was, you know, there was lots of discussions about multilaterals, right? At one point that kind of went away these days, but, uh, you know, solving that issue, I mean, downhole splitting of your well bores, can you stimulate them all at the same time? And Again, it was kind of given up on, I think, but obviously <laughs> that was a topic at one point, right? Um, well, actually, I've been involved just this week in some uh, multilateral completions in Canada. Okay. Some up there, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we're working on some diagnostic approaches to try to determine where your production is coming from when you got right. multilaterals that feed into a vertical well, for instance. So yeah, that might be a direction for the future. And there was something on the drilling side where you drill small holes off of a main well bore, right? To get into more. I mean, there yeah, there's all sorts of ideas that people tried to come up with. And yeah, um, you know, one other thing I think is how long can we push our horizontal wells? You know, obviously there's efforts, a lot of efforts going on with three mile long laterals. Can that be pushed even more? You know, where's, where are the limits on that? Right? So, I mean, I mean, we know production on a per foot basis is probably gonna suffer to some degree, but you know, can you be more efficient with longer and longer laterals or places in urban areas where you just need to drill far, you know, to again, reduce your footprint, right? So, I think those are all things I see on the horizon long, maybe 
trying really long laterals, possibly. Another point that I would like to add is that at the present time, what we are doing is we are basically, we are fracturing two wells uh, simultaneously or zipper or what have you. But as far as the completion of each well is concerned, we follow the same procedure. Uh, you know, so much spacing between clusters and so much injection and so on. And I think there is the it, it result and the effect of that is some le level of overdoing the fracturing. And one of the things that I think would be very useful is if we could determine where the created fractures are. And as we are doing simul fracturing, try to, or zipper fracturing for that matter, but more so in simul fracturing, try to create fractures within the reservoir that uh, allows us to most efficiently drain it as opposed to try to just do as big as we can with the idea that uh, we can't afford to underdo. And that concept of trying to avoid underdoing is appropriate for right now. But I think it is something that needs to be investigated and uh, explored much more detail in the future. You know, thinking about your simul drilling there, Jerry, um, I remember a pioneer project we worked on quite a few years ago where I think you were drilling one well and fracking an offset at the same time. And uh, I think we ran chemical tracers in the well that was being fracked to see if it would communicate with the well that's being drilled. And sure enough, it did. Uh, so does that, does that bring up some sort of a need to protect uh, the drilling wells from the fracked wells or the fracked wells from the drilling wells? Is there any consideration that goes into that or do you even frack an offset when you're drilling another well on the pad? We, we, we've got general rules of thumb of distance between the frack well and the drilling well. And a lot of our, our development is co-development, right? So we might be fracking in a certain bench, but drilling a different bench, et cetera. So there's lots of things to consider as you schedule both drilling operations and completion operations. Um, but those general rules of, of thumb um, have worked and have kept us out of you know, high risk operations. Sounds good. As a matter of fact, I'll share with you my very first exposure to the whole subject was a uh, call I received from an operator in, in, in Canada, a well, somebody who had fractured his well. And he was uh, complaining that he has been sued by his neighbor because while he was fracturing his well, the neighbor who was drilling a well got stuck. And as he was, he was stuck and he was circulating the fluid to get unstuck, he started to recover frac fluid and propent. And as he looked into where that frac fluid and propane was coming from, he discovered that this guy was fracturing his well. Well, the guy who called me was online with me with his lawyer, and he wanted me to go ahead and run my program. He said, sir, you just go run your program to show that under the conditions that we did, the well is 700 meters away from where we were fracturing. Just run your program to show that the well could not have, the fracture could not have extended 700 meters to uh, intersect his well. And I said, but look, if he has already got your frac fluid, if you're the only one who's fracturing the well at that time, and if he has got your frac fluid coming out of his well, then uh, how much credibility do you think I will have to come there and say that, no, it cannot be done. So questions of this kind are, are quite critical and need to be addressed. Just exactly how long do we create these fractures? And when we go there and put six, seven clusters in a horizontal well segment and fracture them simultaneously, uh, how many fractures do we actually propagate? Uh, and where are these fractures? I think these are quite critical that need to be considered and uh, they will be more challenging for simul fracturing if we do them just parallel with each other and fracture both of them together. But the answer to that could cause substantial progress in the art and techniques of fracturing horizontal wells that the, you know, 
two, three, four, five years from now, when smart people get answers to that, will add quite a bit, large benefit to our industry. All right, let me ask a question about uh, FDIs. Uh, well, let me ask a question that was submitted. Uh, have simulfrax been used for parent-child well interactions? And if so, have they reduced the interactions? In other words, have they had any bearing? Simulfrax had any bearing on parent-child interactions and have they even reduced the interactions? The, the, my answer to that would be that we cannot at the present time with present practices, to my knowledge, we cannot detect those interactions. Anybody agree with that? We can't detect the interactions between the simulfrac wells and the parent and child wells. That's certainly something that we do fairly regularly at ProTechnics is looking at those interactions between parent and child wells. Personally, from my standpoint, we haven't seen anything yet. I haven't seen any data that would suggest that a simulfrac might be more beneficial when dealing with parent or child well interactions. No, I can't. How, how do you determine in simulfrax? I, I know we can do this quite uh, readily, in, you know, in zipper frax, for example, or other types. How, how, what technique are you using for detecting uh, interactions in simulfrax? I think, I think there may be, Ali, I think you're talking about it. You're talking about interaction between the wells, your simulfrax. I think Buddy right. was asking if you're doing two simulfrax wells next to a parent well. Yeah. Are you changing the interaction with that? I think that's what he meant. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's take a little change of pace. We do this for every one of these ProTech talks. Uh, we've got some more uh, questions to ask, but I want to take a quick break and uh, then we'll get back to, I think there's four more uh, questions from the attendees. Uh, what we like to do is we like to get some personal perspectives from our panelists. So uh, I'd like to ask you, you've had some time to think about this. Now, don't act like I'm just dropping this on you at the last minute. So, so number one, who has been the most inspirational figure in your life and how did he or she inspire you? So we've had some time to think about it. I remember we had uh, one of the panelists for one of our ProTech talks said the most inspirational person in his life was Winston Churchill because he read his autobiography and, you know, read a lot about him. So, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody in the petroleum industry. Uh, remember your family, a teacher. I remember that uh, our former CEO at Core Lab, Dave Dempsher, uh, he said the smartest man he ever met was his sixth grade education father, who, uh, worked 40 years in the steel mill and put all four of his kids through college. And that was his greatest accomplishment. So tell me, who was the most inspirational figure that you can recall in your life? So along that, those same lines, buddy, I mean, uh, obviously it's my father. I mean, he put myself through college, et cetera. And I, I remember, you know, my, my, my dad worked on cars. He was a body man. He did body work on cars and he would take me and my brother sometimes and he would take us and he would ask us, is this what you want to do when you grow up? If not, you need to get yourself an education so that you won't be doing what I'm doing. Right. And he was a great inspiration to both my brother and I to stay in school, do great and, you know, go to college and, move on and do some great things with, with our lives. So I owe a lot of this to, to my parents, you know, especially as I reflect back and talk about my dad and the things, you know, the getting us to see that life and through his lens, et cetera, really, as you reflect, made a whole lot of sense and has definitely, you know, modeled my career or molded my career into what it is and who I am. Great example, great example. Who else? I, I, I'll go with this, you know, I, when I think about what's going on, you know, I'm, I think older than the rest of you. I get inspired every so often 
by what people within our industry and outside of our industry are getting done that the rest of us didn't either think about or didn't consider them to be possibilities, to be, uh, you know, uh, even on our horizon. And there are so many of them. You, you just see them all the time that they're coming and, and uh, making changes and uh, we are at all with their foresight and their depth of their feeling and the breadth of their thoughts and so on. And the person who, perhaps if I had to mention one person who was doing that was uh, my grandmother. My grandmother uh, was not educated. And uh, she was, you know, in old Iran, she, she got married very young and she had some kids and so on. And I remember the thing which was impressive about her was that anytime she was facing a problem that she didn't know the answer to it, she would give it to one of her grandchildren. And I got a lot of those things from her. You know, she would say, go do this, go do that, go do this. And I had to find a way of doing it. Hmm. So it, she basically, what she did through her action, forced me to think about finding solutions to problems that at the time, at least, did not have an obvious and, uh, you know, give me, a, uh, give me an answer to it. So, but uh, in general, I would say, we are all surrounded by people whose actions and whose uh, innovations and whose uh, contributions are uh, quite outstanding. Amen. That we need to be proud of. How about it, Mike? Yeah, I think I think from from a personal point of view, I mean, I have to also say, obviously, my parents, you know, putting me on the right path, and uh, you know, they they grew up, uh, they were kids in World War II. Uh, I mean, yeah, all the things they went through and, and being able to create a great life for myself and open up all these opportunities that I have right now. I mean, that, that's something that is uh, and very important to me. Um, I mean, from a professional perspective, I mean, no question, Mike Economides, who was kind of my one of my petroleum engineering professors, you know, uh, always challenging, uh, you know, challenge conventional wisdom, try to, you know, think out of the box, cross disciplinary, you know, don't be caught up in just your frack discipline, look at other things maybe that could, could help you, you know, take stuff further. Um, I think he was definitely, a, uh, you know, a nice push there and also to get me to, go out of my shell, you know, go abroad, go international, you know, come here to the U.S. and start a career here. So, yeah, he was a professor at, uh, hmm? he was a professor at the University of Leoben, wasn't he? Yeah. 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 At that time. Yeah. Yeah. I think you were pretty close to him too, weren't you, Ollie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My, Mike and I were very, very good friends and we uh, challenge each other very often, you know, relative to technical things and so on. And we learn from each other. Of course, I did more of the learning than he did. But uh, yeah, Michael was uh, quite, quite creative. And uh, he was not afraid of problems. He wasn't afraid of facing problems. He wasn't afraid of even, you know, in his personal relationship with many people. He's, he had an objective and he went for that objective. And sometimes he would end up, you know, hurting their feeling or appearing to be a uh, little bit too self-centered or whatever, but that's not what he was trying to do. He was trying to find a solution to a, to a given problem. But along this, this line that we're talking about, I'd like to just mention something here just as a way of how we get inspired. My dad grew up in a small village in Iran. And in, in this entire village, there were less than 150 people. And uh, he did his education in one of the religious schools and so on. And he was the first one to leave his village and go to the city. And he went ahead and joined the army and uh, which at that time was a way to make, uh, you know, make a move into to the betterment. And he joined the army and when he retired, he was a judge, he was a colonel in the army and as far as I can remember, you know, of course, at the time we didn't recognize it. He was encouraging all of us to do more and better than what we were doing at the time. Hmm. In other words, he was constantly challenging us. And uh, 
uh, when I left Iran to come to the United States to do my studies and so on, he never once questioned that. He basically, his, his idea was, if you need to do it for your future, go and do it. We'll, we'll, we are behind you, we'll support you, but go do what you want, need to do. And uh, as I get older and older, I more and more appreciate his positive and contributing uh, role in my, uh, in where I am now. Great, Tanner, quickly, probably spending a little more time on this than I intended. Uh, being quick, I mean, I'd have to be the same thing as Jerry. It'd have to be my dad instilling a work ethic in me. And, uh, you know, he'd work long days and come home when I wouldn't hear a complaint about him, something I haven't quite mastered yet. But, you know, he recently finally stopped working two jobs and decided to go back to school and just graduate college, actually, which was kind of nice. Fantastic. All right, another quick personal question. Uh, what discipline do you wish that you had studied more in school or had more exposure to in your professional life? What discipline? I'll give you a hint. Uh, one of the uh, executives that we had in the previous ProTech talk said he wished that, uh, this was sort of a wish for his subordinates, that they had better business acumen, you know, that they understood uh, the bottom line, they understood cash flow, things like that. But for you, what disciplines uh, do you wish you had studied more? You'd like to have mastered better than you have? I should have known. You guys, there's nothing that you haven't mastered, right? I no, you know, along along with that executive said that that goes right in line with, you know. I wish myself along with, you know, folks that work in my department and peers, et cetera, would have a better understanding of that. But personally for myself, I love what I do. I, I, I love my job. I was born to do this. So I, you know, I have no second thoughts of what else I would have loved to learn, honestly. At the end of the day, if I could have some more courses on you know, business acumen, et cetera, that'd be fantastic, but I wouldn't change anything for my life. You know, the reason, the reason I have inquired is because there are so many things that I encounter from day to day that I wish I knew more about. Me and too. So, yeah. And uh, so if I, I'm just thinking, which one of these would I want to, to uh, finger, you know, which one of them do I want to, uh, put forward and uh, there, there's so much uh, every as I especially as we move forward and you see things which are being done and uh, uh, it's always amazing I wish I knew more about this I wish I knew more about that Same so here. yeah the, 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 there's no there's no single subject I mean every everything I see around me is a challenge to me at least about a mic some area you wish you'd dwell more, spend more time on, or I'll keep it on the lighter side. Uh, I was always, I always loved astronomy, looking at the sky. Instead of looking at the sky, I'm looking two miles underground now, or trying to. <laughs> I can't see anything. <laughs> yeah, there's actually an engineer in town. I won't mention his name, but uh, he's a very interesting guy. But his favorite subject and the thing that he would like to talk about when you go visit him in his office was astrophysics. So I knew he was going to ask me something about astrophysics every time I go over there. So I had to bone up on it a little bit before I go call on him. Because he wanted to know about what happened to Pluto. Why isn't it a planet again? What's your answer for that and all this business? So I can understand what you're saying. Tanner, how about you? Business for sure. Business action. Yeah, have. me too. I think we all, you know, we're engineers. We thought, I don't need business. What's the point of business? You know, that's somebody else does that part. But, you know, it probably been a good idea for all of us to have gotten an MBA probably. I just, I just couldn't imagine sitting through finance courses and all that sort of thing personally. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, we have quite a few young engineers online today. We always do. Uh, quickly offer one kernel of wisdom 
to these young professionals in our industry that you feel like could benefit their career development, what would it be? What would that one kernel of wisdom be? I will give, offer mine. Don't be afraid of failure. Very good one. You're not failing, you're not trying very hard. All right, who's next? Jerry, Colonel of Wisdom. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Great. Mike? I think patience uh, when you're in your career, you know, be patient, uh, stick to what you do well, and, you know, try to learn, obviously, but patience. I think, I think these days, maybe younger generation, you know, instant gratification society, everybody wants to move ahead so quickly, right? Yep. That would be one thing I would recommend. You know, I have a family member just kind of like that. Can't understand why they can't start out as a vice president. <laughs> okay, Tanner. Uh, keep an open mind, new ideas, new technologies, new developments, new ways of doing things. See a lot of people kind of dig their heels in their sand with their opinion of their mental model and aren't really flexible that anything that comes across that might change that, differ from that. Great advice. All right, here's the last, uh, quickly, four questions that came in from the attendees. Uh, and maybe we've kind of covered some of this already. Uh, have you seen any negative impact in well performance because of simulfrax for any particular reason? seen any negatives come from them? Jerry says no, Holly no, Mike no, Tanner no, got it. Uh, and this is another question, not all FDIs are alike, for instance, fluid migration, prop frac hits, or elastic interactions. Uh, how do you measure, this may be too long a question, but how do you measure each type of frac hit and what type of frac hits have a higher negative impact on production? I will go ahead and take a shot at that. Now, wait a minute. you got a whole book on this, so be exactly. brief. Here. Okay, then I'll wait for others to talk. No, no, go on. You already started. The, uh, what we call frac hits, but first of all, let, let, let me just preach for just a second. I prefer if we don't call it frac hit. You see, hitting has got a negative connotation. And when you consider all of the social comment, commentary and social objections to fracturing and so on, when we say a frac hit, it indicates that there's something happening we shouldn't have and it's undesirable. That's the reason we came up with, you know, the group of us who investigated the subject, we came up with the word frac driven interactions to make it neutral so that, you know, it has got positive and it has got sometimes negative effects. I also let me add another thing, which is I think the, uh, people need to know, and that is through experience, we have pretty much managed to have solutions and to have approaches to mitigate and minimize occasional negative uh, consequences of these frac interactions. Uh, they are not as bad as they used to be by any stretch of imagination. But the uh, there are two, three things that we do. The first indication, which is what we can get in real time, is pressure measurement in the offset well. You record the pressure in the offset well, and as soon as there is an interaction, you see a pressure increase. So that's the very simplest way. Now, the pressure increase by itself uh, does not indicate exactly what kind you got, except the magnitude of pressure does. If you get pressure increases more than 10, 15, 20 PSI, you most likely had frac to frac connection and link. And in some cases, I have actually, uh, I've got data and I've written, uh, I've analyzed data in which the interaction was more than a thousand PSI. So it wasn't a ma minor thing, but others complementing uh, measurements that go with it and increase our confidence in what we are seeing would be the tracer uh, fluids, when you recover the tracer fluid from an offset well, it coming out of the well, there's no question but that the fluid moved from one well, from the fractures in one well into the fractures in the other well. So the next uh, confidence is tracer. The only difficulty with tracers is that you cannot do it real time, you have to wait. But I strongly recommend doing it because it gives you confidence in the, in the uh, 
analysis that you're doing. And then you can go beyond that and uh, look at, for example, uh, you know, micro seismic, uh, micro seismic, in my experience, has less uh, certainty in, in the analysis of it than, let's say, uh, tracer uh, ser searching. Fiber optics are being used, and fiber optics, of course, if they are, you are near the well bore, they are uh, more reliable, but as you get to, an to analyze signals from farther and farther away, the reliability decreases. But uh, I think frac driven interactions, uh, in my view, of course, are the tools for the future generation of the hydraulic fracturing treatments. Okay. How about it, Mike? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, Ali, I kind of, uh, you know, he's he's dealt with this quite a bit and looked at this quite a bit. One, one thing maybe I want to bring in, you know, because we are doing quite a bit of offset well monitoring now these days with pressure gauges and also trying to, you know, figure out what does the signature mean and all that. But uh, aside from that, one thing I do see and to encourage operators is, you know, when you're doing offset well monitoring to get maybe some idea on what you have in, in the well, in the parent well, you know, what, what's your hydrostatic in that well so we can get some reasonable, you know, bottom hole pressure estimate of what that surface pressure impact really is downhole and relate that to closure stress and, you know, other things, pore pressure, whatever, right? But I, I see that missing. I mean, we're only looking at the surface data and, and you don't need a gauge down there. I mean, but maybe just, or just do a dip in or something at one point if it's important, right? So that, that would be one thing, you know, additional that may be fairly simple, simple to do or to, to, to figure out what's in the parent well, right? Fluid wise. And I, I will add to what Mike is talking about because that's very, very important. A gas well does not interact, the interaction in the gas well is very different than a well which is full of uh, water or you know, oil or whatever. And by changing the volume of mixture of oil and gas and water in the well, you can get different magnitude interaction. So there's a lot of wisdom to what Mike is saying. And actually, uh, this is a pitch for my book, if you like, uh, or for my course. Uh, there are ways of measuring them. And these measurements are quite simple and straightforward. You can measure uh, these parameters and make engineering calculations. The other advantage of frac interactions that I like to mention is their ease of installation and cost. They're not that expensive and they're very, very easy to install and uh, the data is readily available and you can be analyzing it. So it is a very convenient way of moving forward with it. One of the things that I'll have, buddy, is uh, I know Ali mentioned a whole lot of different technologies in there. And from, from our perspective, that's really the key to understanding what's going on downhole. There, isn't, there aren't downhole goggles yet. You need multiple technologies, whether you're looking at prop and tracers, near well board cluster efficiency, and how that relates to our field communication, comparing that real time data to what we're seeing from overlapping SRVs. From our standpoint, that's really kind of what we're looking for is how many different data points can you get pointing in the same direction. That's really how you can get the best answer to your questions. Great. Okay. Uh, another poll question. I think we're getting behind here. <clears throat> sure. This is our, we got two more. This is our last one. And it's oh, uh, no, not so far behind after all. Kind of topical for what we were just discussing. So let me launch it here. Okay, where do you see, yeah, this is timely. Where do you see diagnostics providing the most benefit in evaluating the downhole effects of a simul frac? Probably could be said about any frac for that matter. Cluster efficiency, fracture driven interactions, engineered perforating parent child interactions, all the above, none of the above. Everyone vote, please. Yeah, we'll give this one just a second, but buddy, if you guys wanna chat or if anyone has any thoughts, we can Okay, come back and announce the results. Yeah, while the group's moving, I'll come back. Okay, last question. No, nope. um, yeah. if you guys want to discuss this poll question and then- oh, you want to discuss that one, okay. How about it? I was just going to comment, you know, Jerry's comment about kind of moving full speed ahead towards 
uh, simulfrax, you know, I think that makes a lot of room for kind of a lot of unknowns when you're switching from zipper frax to simulfrax and also has a lot of room for fine tuning, kind of as Ollie mentioned earlier, that there's it's going to be, you know, more unknowns again when you're completing wells at the same time. And, you know, that's something that we've really been focusing on is what is that, what's actually going on down there once we figure out the surface logistics, once we figure out how to frack these wells consistently, you know, what are we actually doing down pole and how can we fine tune that? Moving forward. Good point. I, I do see cluster efficiency being one thing for me that comes to mind versus a standard. You know, is is there tr can we see some kind of an effect because of the simul operation on that? True. Yeah. Well, speaking of cluster efficiency, the last question here. Oops. Here's our results. All of the above. Excellent. Cluster efficiency, probably the single most voted uh, diagnostic attribute. Okay. All right, the last question, uh, submitted question. In your experience, this is debated, been discussed, many papers on the subject. In your experience, how many clusters contribute to production per frac stage, realistically? Is, is the number of effective clusters a significant factor in improving completion efficiency? I will take a shot at that answer. The first thing to recognize, and I think this has been reported, is that the, all the different stages of a horizontal well do not contribute equally to production. As a matter of fact, there's data published which says something like 30 or 40% of the production, I mean, 30-40% uh, of the stages uh, contribute to more than 90% of the production. So obviously the question that Mike raised and of course the respondents also raised is the cluster efficiency is quite important. Uh, we went to the extreme of putting these clusters uh, five feet apart. And uh, I've got data and of course, uh, Buddy, you have got much better of this data than I do that shows that even when the, uh, we put these clusters 20, 30 feet apart, the fractures right around the well bore connect to each other, join each other. So the question of cluster efficiency is very critical and it's very important. The, I would add to that, that the best way to establish that is actually to interaction, the determining interactions and what's happening. The, from what I see, the number of uh, clusters that contribute to production are substantially lower than the number of clusters that we create in the, in the horizontal well. You know, I think, buddy, this is a question that we've internally been trying to tackle. I think that's why part of why we come out with our energetic diagnostic system is to address this very question. You know, something new that we offer where we can actually inject our or introduce our tracers through the perforating guns, which allows us to get more resolution, if we could put a unique tracer in every single perforation or every single cluster, then we could start analyzing and looking at how are those individual clusters flowing back in a given stage? Are we seeing production from all eight or nine that we shot or is that number closer to five or six? So that's certainly something that's on our radar that we can look at trying to answer. About it, Jerry, how much, how seriously do you take cluster efficiency and, and, uh, and you guys interpretation of your completions? So quite a bit, buddy. Uh, you know, one of our studies that we've got going on, and I think all the guys have touched on it, is you want to look at that fracture-driven interaction, right? That's key. But it, you can't do it all alone. You've got to pair it with, you know, trying to measure it with cluster efficiency to paint a bigger picture. So we're utilizing some, you know, fracture-driven interaction technology, you know, to help us with those calculations, but also pairing it with, you know, some tools like dark vision, et cetera, and trying to determine the geometry of the perforations and erosion, et cetera, to help us better understand cluster efficiency along with what we're seeing with, you know, the fracture interaction technology, right? You, it's not one tool that gives you the entire picture. You've got to use multiple tools to help you better understand um, what's, what's best and 
you know, when you do those kind of things, you gotta, you gotta have different sets of trials, right? Different sets of baselines, et cetera, to compare. If I do this rate at these number of clusters, what does the interaction look like? And then what does the cluster efficiency look like, et cetera? So lots of great things that we could do, whether it's with Simulfrac, Zipperfrac, these are all things that we can all do a better job of trying to understand and get the most effective completion possible. Mike, what do you say? Closing words here. Yeah, I mean, I think on the execution side, I mean, the cluster efficiency, I think, has improved on average. I mean, I hear numbers, you know, and look at publications, 65 to 85 percent, kind of what we're already comfortable with. A lot of efforts going on on the perforating side, you know, how to maximize that and maximize the distribution of the actual province as well, not just the fluid, right? But I think one thing that's that's still missing, and unfortunately, it's a, a lot of times it's a cost prohibit you know prohibits prohibited people aren't doing it because of cost is production logs you know trying to really assess where the production is coming from right there's just not enough information on that to truly make solid conclusions I think and I know it's it's, it's a pricey thing right but getting good kind of production log data where your production is coming from right so, or I mean, tracers obviously are being used and all that, but, and also doing it at different times along the history of the well, reproduction history, right? Not just at one point in time, but seeing does it change over time? You know, those kind of things. I mean, that would be really the thing to, to use to be able to assess that truly, right? So. Well, thanks folks. Uh, really appreciate your contribution. You're spending the time with us. It's. Uh... It's been very informative, educational. Uh, you know, there's a lot of experience uh, in those four brains there, and we appreciate you sharing it with us. And we look forward to to having more of these ProTech talks in the future. And uh, hopefully, we can invo involve you folks and some of your colleagues in the future ones. And uh, hopefully, we'll all be better for it for having shared these experiences. Any closing comments there, Derek? Nope, we're all set. So uh, thank you everyone for coming out. Appreciate the attendance. Like I said, all um, we do have a few questions we didn't get to. Uh, we'll try to follow up with you on those and please reach out to us if you have any questions. We'll get the recording up as soon as we can. Thank you. I, I would like to I would like to thank Buddy and Derek and Protechnics for initiating this and uh, putting it into effect. And when you think the amount of information that was exchanged today, uh, what you did was quite remarkable, and I want to congratulate you for having thought about this and uh, having organized this. And uh, from my perspective, uh, it was quite educational. I learned quite a bit listening to the colleagues uh, on the panel. And, uh, and Buddy, you did a very good job of moderating it. Congratulations. Surprise, really surprise, good. huh? <laughs> no, no, I'm not surprised. You, you, you lived up to expectations. Thank you, Ali. This is, I think, number 11 for us. So we're, we're starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> yep. And Ali, you'd, you'd, job, usually, you'd use, charge $200 an hour to share all this knowledge with your some of your customers, huh? <laughs> yeah, I send you a bill for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, folks. And so Thank would everybody. You. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Take buddy. care. Thank you. Be safe. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Good discussion.